Greetings, everybody. My name is Naveen Kishore, and I'm the publisher at Siegel Books. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you viewers, listeners, to our third session, jointly presented with Goethe Institute Calcutta, and of course, Siegel Books. Uh, very briefly, I want to welcome and thank our friend and author and poet, Nora Basong, who is here from uh, Berlin. And Sandeep, Sandeep Roy, also friend, unfortunately not published by me. I hope he will be one day. And author and journalist and radio podcaster, who is the host for all our various conversations. Uh, may I ask Laura and Sudeep to join us, please? Hi, Sudeep. Hi, Naveen. Hello, Nora. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so much for doing this. It's such a difficult time for everybody, though I am hoping that things are going to open up elsewhere, but we are still going through a very dark kind of a time. So thank you so much for doing this conversation. Uh, I just have a small brief text to set the tone uh, from dear old W.G. Sibold, and it goes something like this, and it sort of sums up a kind of legacy of other times. Our memories are quite similar, but pickled alive in a poison which accompanies objects too as a part of this emptiness. The heartening message that Pythagoras once would listen to the stars barely comes down to us now. Then let us hope our children are learning to dance in the dark. Sadeep, all yours. Thank you, Naveen. Well, let us hope that children are learning to dance in the dark or at least uh, sing or talk or do something because uh, we seem to be in a, we've been in this tunnel for a long time. And uh, Nora, I always start these conversations uh, talking a little bit about this strange world we find ourselves in these days. Has the pandemic forced you to reevaluate your life and priorities or have you, as the poem uh, Naveen shared you know have you learned to dance in the dark <laughs> well um i try to but uh, i think it it depends it was i had like some some darker times where i was not so good in dancing where i was struggling uh, i had better times uh, during this pandemic situation I had times when i even um valued this slow slowliness, this um, this lockdown that let me stay at, at home and gave me um, time, um, time to think, time to read. But um, I think that this were only some some days, some weeks, and then you you feel um, the isolation in the in the society that everyone goes back to his or her family or like not even friends but only the, mm. the 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 closest friends and you 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 lose so many um relations uh during this time then of course also the fear uh i mean um i had loss in my family also like uh death that we're not connected with uh, covid but um but they were of course uh different than in other times because uh, even things like funerals didn't uh, didn't work very well or, or not uh, they were very strange so uh, I had to to learn to live in a, in a very different um, solitary world like I think everybody else had to learn um, to 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 react to these new circumstances well, when, I mean, when you say solitary world, I, uh, 
I suddenly, I, I couldn't help but remember there's a line in your book, Gramsci's Fall, where he's in solitary, you know, he's in prison. And there's yeah. a line in there where, let me find it uh, because I'd written it down, where he says, Gramsci wanders back and forth in his cell like a fly that doesn't know where to die. And, uh, you know, like going through this experience in a way, has it, uh, did it make you think more about, you know, because as a writer, you had to imagine what it felt like for a Gramsci to be spending that life cooped up in his prison cell. And now we've spent a year where for many, much of that year, we've been cooped up in our little cells. Yeah. I mean, of course, uh, like for Gramsci, the situation was was much harder. Uh, he was he was totally isolated. He was uh, prisoned under Mussolini, under the fascist regime. Um, he was he was a political prisoner. Um, and but still, I I, I was thinking of, uh, of Gramsci quite a lot during this last year. And um, when I wrote the book Gramsci's Fall. Uh, of course, I tried to to understand the uh, loneliness that he must have felt during this time. Also, I mean, if you read his his letters, um, you feel that very strong how he loses the connections uh, to the people he loves, like his uh, wife, his kids, uh, his, his family, and and best friends, and that he feels um, lost by them. And I think that is that is a part of, of Gramsci's biography that touched me a lot because it tells a lot about uh, what, what humans are and what political work is. And it's always uh, something that has to do with connections, has always something to do with, uh, with the people you're working for, or you fight for. And then he is thrown back totally in a lonely situation, not even knowing whether uh, the, the party, the Communist Party, was working for still believes in him and still wants to rescue him. So, um, as I said, it's a much um, more difficult and dangerous situation for him than it was. Well, I'm quite um, quite lucky that I have my my own apartment. Uh, I mean, I still can go outside. I'm not a prisoner, but of course, uh, this day and day and day this repetition of loneliness and isolation that is something that um, really goes beyond the surface of what we normally are that that really gets deep into our souls and into our yeah also into our moods of course and um, I think to cope with uh, isolation and solid solitary uh, is something that we can learn by such strong characters as, as Gramsci was and who continued to write just to to have some sort of connection with the world outside his cell. Yeah because there, there's this other line where he says there is no point of living when the connections to the outside world are dissolving one after the other and of course as you say the circumstances for him are very different but we are in our own way also understanding the importance of those connections and what it means when these connections dissolve. And as you say, you know, with the funerals, even if it's not related to COVID, you can't get the closure you expect to get at a funeral anymore. Yep, that was, that was a very, very strange situation. I mean, funerals are one, that is one moment when you really get to an existential dimension of what what you what you experience in your life you lose some somebody who was really close and then at the funerals during this covid uh, lockdown here in germany it was not allowed that you could hug your relatives because you were all in sorrow uh, but you had to stay apart from each other and that is that is so strange i mean that's what what we had to i think everywhere in the world what we had to cope with um, the emotional um, yeah breakdown uh, when when we when when what rescues us or what helps us is distance but it's also on the other other hand 
what breaks us because mm. distance is nothing that is that is healthy for for a long time but still i mean it was it, it was the one thing we could do just to 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 fight the pandemic uh, and it was necessary how is berlin right now well today is a very very good day i would say because um the the numbers of COVID infections are going down for several days now and today the cafes and restaurants uh, mm -hmm. reopened and that is uh, I just can say a wonderful feeling I was just I, I was only going to the supermarket but I saw like the restaurant at the end of my street like people sitting there having the lunch and it was just so wonderful you don't even have to talk to them or didn't even have to greet them but you see people and you see life on the street and that was something that was missing so much, so really much. Um, so <laughs> I, I was just looking at pictures a friend had shared in Instagram. He's in Paris, and he had this picture of people sitting outside in a cafe in Paris. And and in an, in another time, it would have been just another picture. But right now in Kolkata, where we are in lockdown and we don't know when we'll be able to do that, it was um, you know it felt both something to aspire to, and I have to admit, I was a little jealous. <laughs> yeah, I, I I know that because uh, I was seeing like uh, photos of I think London City where they already had uh, the opening and also from Tel Aviv, and we were still sitting locked down in our apartments and rooms and flats and we didn't and I think that is something that we are not used anymore uh, that we didn't have a concrete plan we didn't have any dates. We didn't have politicians who said, well, and on May 15th, we will open everything up because uh, no one could foresee uh, mm. what was happening and how it would, uh, yeah, how, how the, um, the the pandemic would, um, would react on, on different, different changes. So I think that is something that we normally, uh, really are not used to anymore that we have uncertainty about the future that uh, at least in Germany that's something we are really not good on <laughs> and um, that was something we had to learn in a very short time to uh, to cope with uncertainty and to cope with uh, plans that you cannot that they yeah, can that only can from 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 today to tomorrow, but not from today to end of month or so. Yeah, I mean, it was the same here. In the beginning of this year, everything was as close to normal as it had been for a long time. And then suddenly the second wave hit and everybody is being locked down. And now I worry sometimes that uh, we're heading to a situation in a world where we'll have the vaccine haves and the vaccine have nots. and you know, and we're going to be separated by that. You know, at one time it felt like the whole world was coming together because of the pandemic. And now there'll be this sort of vaccine line dividing us from the, between the haves and have nots. I don't know. Exactly. But I think that's, uh, I mean, the vaccine is, is one thing, but that was um, a development I was, I was noticing through the whole pandemic that on the one hand, you saw some solidarity and some hope that this pandemic that hit the whole world, it was the global thing that hit the whole world, let it be the, the wealthy uh, France and Germany, as well as uh, whatever Nigeria or other parts of the world. Uh, totally it was it was hitting uh like democratic uh, countries as well as non-democratic countries so but on the same time there was the solidarity but there was also the division and the borders came back in europe uh we felt that very strong uh, but also the division between the wealthy countries and the not so wealthy countries it was not the global solidarity it was the global solidarity in words, but uh, by reaction and by uh, really uh, doing things, it was a um, more nationalistic thing that uh, every every country, every nation tried to uh, get get the vaccine, get the hospital beds, uh, get get the best doctors. So 
it was a chance to more solidarity and it was um well a development to to a world that still is quite quite divided and quite divided in uh, nations and wealth in um people that can afford more safety mm. um so uh i think we yeah it was the, both both so what has the pandemic in your view done to a notion the notion of europeanness um it goes a bit in the same direction it's it was um in the first weeks it was very nationalistic i would say um, i mean for example germany is quite strong a pro-european we have to get the european union forward and so on and so on but in the in the first days and weeks um it was it was just uh that well we had this very strong breakout in italy and in italy people north italy it's not far away from germany mm. uh people were dying because the hospitals were full and it took look i don't I'm, i'm not really sure how much but two weeks or so till the german hospitals opened for italian ill people and that that i think it it would have been not only uh, a strong sign would have saved life in the if the european union would have worked faster together and just to understand that this is not um not only a union of different nations and different countries but really some some solidarity group and um, that if people are dying in, in north italy it that's that our own neighbors that that is not um that is not just just happening to some someone else and i think that was uh something that yeah i think the european union has to uh get clear signs of, of solidarity and unification now to um to to yeah get get it back um mm. on a on a on a way yeah I, i guess it it really tests like all crises it tests our uh, you know what holds us together what we share what we value and you know whether because you can make a lot of nice pretty words about you know what a union means but ultimately the, these are the moments that put it to test so it would like to get back to gramshi uh i'm not an academic and i have spent i have to confess i've spent my entire life running away from a word like hegemony <laughs> <laughs> I always get scared when people use that <laughs> word in, in a presentation but you know I think the time has finally come in talking to you that I cannot escape that word anymore we cannot talk about Antonio Gramsci Marxist philosopher and political theorist as a character without talking about cultural hegemony but what does it what does it mean to you in simplest terms um cultural hegemony um yeah. I mean that that was this um well of course I I connected very much with Gramsci of course although uh it developed from those times when Gramsci wrote about it like in the 1920s or 1910s um and right now for example in Germany we see uh, a strong fight for hegemony from the right wing from the really uh radical right wing who um as well as the marxist in the 60s and 70s read gramsci now the strong right radical right wing are reading gramsci and uh they use oh, some interesting. yeah yeah it's interesting <laughs> it's also it's frightening and uh they're using his uh theory his they are very interested in like revolution uh, i think that some of them really want to start a revolution um they want to to gain the cultural hege hege hegemony uh here in in Germany i mean i have to say they're not as successful as like uh, we're not at the end of the Weimar republic it's not that we have another hitler in the next two years or so or 
five years or 20 years, I hope, I, I hope we'll never have that again. But still, um, there are some, some strong uh, groups uh, that, that work against the democracy, that work against uh, parliamentarism, and that, of course, they, they take some ideas out of Gramsci's whole theory. I mean, Gramsci was someone who thought about uh, a lot about uh, people who are marginalized, who about people, he, he wanted actually something like solidarity, uh, justice, and something uh, that, that every person is worth the same. That's not what the right wings, like right wing people want this radical right wing people, but they just take out some some ideas of, of Gramsci um, and put it like like a very te technical thing into their own idea of development of the society. And that's quite, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, but it's also frightening. And I think that uh, the, the, the question of cultural hegemony has a lot to do um, how you talk to people, how you take people and their thinking serious and also that you understand that power uh, is not only uh, established by elections but it has a way towards it that you have to have different steps before that to to establish an idea and then if you if you have established an idea then you can then you can follow them. It's quite quite easy to 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 follow the the, the path that you already built. So, I mean, in many parts of the world, communism is not as successful as it has been in years past. In right now, we had elections in Bengal and Kolkata, and for the first time in decades, not a single communist was elected to the local assembly. And this is a state which until 2011 had been ruled for 34 straight years by communists. Um, so in that sense, would it be an exaggeration to say that, uh, that someone like Gramsci is finding almost more relevance to these extreme right-wing people who are picking bits and pieces out of him than to the current Euro communists? Um. Well, I think it's it's difficult. I mean, it's not Gramsci that they, they just I have to, to underline that uh, because it's it's not really Gramsci that the, the right wing, uh, the radical right wing is using. They they just use some taking some parts of his ideas, taking some parts out of it. Um, but of course, you can say, for example, a totally different uh, example, but I think it, it fits if you look at the United States, Pete Buttigieg, who was running for, for president candidate candidate um well he, he, he didn't as we know right. it was not him but but still he was quite successful he's the son of a gramsci translator oh. and um actually i wanted to write a, an essay about it then then the COVID um, pandemic started and i was uh, with my thoughts somewhere else but um how for his father gramsci of course was super important but if you look at Pete Buttigieg who is a, who's a left-wing politician um, Gramsci seems not really to play a very important role um, and I think what what might have be the the turning point uh, in in the US but but also probably global is that um, the the fight the, the 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 old marxist fight for equality is somehow um yeah newly arranged by identity politics that's the new thing or the new fight for equality that that works a bit different you, of course you can still work with Gramsci because he had a very strong view and he had a very strong perspective uh, on those who are marginalized in societies, the subaltern, as he, as he uh, says. Um, so it's, it's just, uh, I think that the old Marxist parties do not really fit at the moment to our societies and uh, to the fights that in our societies are, are going on. 
but I, I think that I'm not, not sure about uh, Marxism because in Germany, I mean, we were too close to the Soviet Union with the East German uh, part. So I think Marxism is not really, uh, it doesn't have a chance here in Germany, but um, uh, the socialist, the, the moderate socialist, I think that what, what would, could be important is to, to get back to idea where the, the social the question and the social equality question and the identity politics get together and that those are not two different fights for equality but that they understand that it's one fight for a more equal and more just work with more justice that's actually very interesting nara and i don't really want to get into the details of indian politics here but in the elections we just had in our part of the world in bengal we actually very much saw what you were talking about, where one political party was very much trying to appeal to the identity politics of people, whereas for 34 years, the Marxists here had tried to paper over those identity politics and say, you know, now your identity as a as, as worker or whatever, not, not your ethnic identity or your religious identity and all of these. But, you know, I mean, and you have this in your book, in your book where Gramsci's in prison and, uh, you know, he borrows that famous phrase from Romain Rolland, where he prays about the pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will. And he's, of course, talking in the context of the 1930s, there's growing authoritarian trends, and that is where the pessimism is coming from. But he has optimistic commitment that there'll be social transformation is still possible via some kind of workers movement. But now if you look around the world and you see these growing authoritarian trends, you know, in many parts of Europe, more authoritarian leaders are getting more popular. We've seen this in India, uh, uh, you know, perhaps a Donald Trump lost in this election in the US, but far more narrowly than people would have thought. Um, we, so we see that growing authoritarian trend and the pessimism of the intellect, as it were. Where do you see the, do you see the optimism of the will now? Uh, yeah, at least I, I try to. <laughs> uh, I, am, I, I see a lot of these pessimistic things. Um, but uh, I have to say that like two or three years ago, my pessimism was even stronger and I was uh, I didn't find any optimism anymore it was after the Trump election it was after the Brexit here here in uh, Europe um, and you saw like the authoritarian regimes uh, in some European countries are were getting stronger or um, and they were really changing uh, the system and that was that was uh, frightening um, now I, I actually with uh, well, with the, the election of Joe Biden, at least I see that there can be a change in the other direction. I don't see like Joe Biden is not not like like the Messiah or so, but right. still he is a he is a politician uh, who who makes politics and not narcissism, and um, he's he's not an authoritarian um, dictator. So. Um, and then I see uh, some some good parts about about Europe that um, behind the scenes there was there was a lot working and that there was a lot uh, for in the European Union there was a lot working that um, for example uh, money uh, funds were were um, created to to help people who were suffering during the pandemic situation let it be people who uh, were having restaurants or other things, right. businesses that they had to close. So uh, there was a um, cooperation that really worked and worked fast and uh, quite fast for Europe, but at least. <laughs> so, uh, and and still, I think um, right now I'm, I'm writing a book about um, politicians of my age and um, I see some, um, some development that give me some optimism. Uh, they are not as loud as, for example, the 68 revolutionaries, uh, if you look at the, the student revolution, um, but uh, they are um, they are strong. They 
know what they want. And uh, for example, I think that the, the green movement, I'm, I'm not so sure about the Green Party as right now because they, they sometimes forget like social questions, but um, like the, the fight for uh, to stop the climate, climate change. change. That is really strong. There are a lot of people my age or younger that really, really fight for it. And it's not only Greta Thunberg who is who's like the, the one symbol for it, but there are a lot of people who really uh, care about that. And there are people who go on the streets to 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 for a manifestation, but there are also people who work in the, with the science just to solve problems. And I think it's not something that we, we can lean back and think, well, everything will go well. But still, I think that um, people noticed that leaning back is not, not the right thing to do. And that um, as terrible as uh, I think it was that Donald Trump was elected, at least it had something good that people woke up and that people recognized that it's not enough just to 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 watch po politics like a football game and so that we have um in our civil society we have to to, to take our own courage and to our own engagement and mm. uh, and only then we can we can live with optimism yeah i mean that if is we forget that true. again then i think the pessimism will get strong again that's true because i think you often take things for granted and you assume the world will move in a certain direction and uh, a polarizing figure like donald trump also galvanizes the opposition against him where they feel that you know that no no this is enough this is the line in the sand and we must organize as opposed to thinking that you know there's nothing i can really do about climate change or whatever or you think uh, okay, these politicians, they'll do it in their own slow way. But yeah. from what you were saying, you know, about these voices, these young politicians that you are working on, the book you're working on, it, I was reminded also of something else that Ramshi said, where he says everyone is an intellectual, but not everyone takes on the role of an intellectual in society. So in Germany right now, are voices like these ones, these authors, people like you, are they prominent as public intellectuals? Are they being heard in the course of everything we've been going through with this pandemic and other things? Well, I think uh, not as much as I had uh, hoped for, but I have to say as well, not as intelligent as I had hoped for. So <laughs> uh, I think that some, um, some writers who have like a huge audience and who are used to their own freedom um i think they were focused too much on their own situation and they are still in a very privileged situation as although of course it's not nice to uh see that your own child cannot go to school um to to have uh to, to be afraid about your parents and so on, but um, they're still quite privileged. And we have uh, what we were, what we could see in Germany is that um, wealth and poverty did decide quite often about uh, your situation in this pandemic. Let it be economically. Uh, so the ones who didn't have an, enough at the beginning of the pandemic suffered the most, of course, and they lost the most uh, very often but then also uh, let it be on the health issues mm. that um if you if you uh, live in a in a very small apartment uh in a very crowded house uh you probably uh will get you you're more in risk to to get an inf infection and then uh, also your uh, the psychic uh psychological uh things that uh, that you cannot cope with. Um, so, But do uh, you think, Nora, that writers right now, you know, writers also need, you know, they need support. They sometimes need support from the state. So do you think writers right now can challenge cultural hegemony 
infiltrate it or do they actually end up or at the risk of, are they at the risk of serving it? Um, I think I, I cannot really respond that in general. I think there are some who really still try to, to make an impact in the society and to to um, give a new perspective on problems and to to yeah to give new ideas and then there are others who which is quite okay i mean you can be a writer and just be interested in i don't know love stories or so right. uh, and that that is quite fine that you, you don't have to be a political writer um but to get back on on the on the quote you you um you read from gramsci this uh that not everybody uh, that everybody is an intellectual so that means that everybody has the capacity to see the world and to to um, to analyze the world in its own way and to to see problems and to to have ideas about the solution of those problems, but not everybody is heard, uh, and I think that is that is a problem. That um, for example, we had like some some stars or um, well quite uh, publicly known people who uh, who posted their own opinion about the pandemic situation that were not really the brightest people in mm. Germany, <laughs> but they were heard quite loud. So, um, so I think uh, this, that th the quote uh, of Gramsci is still so true. And that is quite sad that we still have uh, like the, the loudspeaker just in the hands of some few people and we over or not over here there's a false friend and <laughs> uh, so we don't hear uh um a lot of voices and i think that is something that still has to to be changed and we saw in the pandemic how what terrible how terrible a situation could become when you don't listen to those who are marginalized who are uh, not in the center of the um of the cities who are not in the center mm. of, of, of our uh, focus. So, um, yeah. We're still so seeing think... that right now in India, you know, with the stories we hear. I mean, for a while we were hearing all these stories of people, desperate people asking for oxygen or beds on Twitter, and that made international news. But, uh, but also when you think about it, it is the people who had access to Twitter or new people who had access to Twitter who were doing it. Now, when the pandemic moves into deep into rural India, we don't hear about it much because that's not on Twitter. And so we often tend to think that everything that's not on Twitter doesn't exist at all, but of course it does. I, I wanted to get, uh, ask you a question that has come in from a listener, and I wanted to encourage people who are listening, if they have questions for Nora, to uh, send them in and we'll try to get to them. And this is from someone named Shulogna, and Shulogna asks, as a writer, how do you look at the refugee problem which Germany is facing now and which is helping the AFD to gain more support? Oh, this is a, it's a complex question. Um, well, first thing, right at the moment, I think um, that during the pandemic, um, the refugee um, situation was a bit put out of the focus that had a good uh, um, side, which, well, the AFD was not in the middle of all uh, debates anymore. And they also lost uh, um, some, some, some voter voters. Um, but on the other hand- You should quickly explain what the AFD is. The AFD is a um, populistic, nationalistic, uh, right-wing party here in Germany. Um, they have, of course, different politicians, but they have, um, I think that, for example, Björn Höck is someone who really is, um, well, he is close to uh, fascism and, uh, uh, well, he, he is someone who um, made a speech once um, explaining that Gramsci was one of the thinkers that impressed him very much. So that's that gets back to, to the one point I explained mm. earlier that uh, those people read Gramsci. Of course, they uh, hate Marxism, but they hate social, well, socialism was in the Nazi 
party to. <laughs> Uh, but uh, they take out some some parts of it, some some uh, some raisins out of the cookie. Right. Uh, and uh, so, but uh, during the pandemic, it was also um, that the situation of uh, the refugees, for example, who were stuck in Greece under terrible sanitary situ uh, conditions, uh, that that got out of the focus. Everybody was talking about uh, the, the, well, the, the infection rate and about COVID uh, infected people and about the, the lockdown, about homeschooling, about everything that was connected with uh, COVID. But that there uh, on the, in the refugee camps in Greece, there, there would, had only to be one, um, one spreader and the whole oh, okay. camp would be uh, like like a total disaster. So, but that is only um, yeah, it's it's only a moment of the of a constant situation that you have people there. The, the Europe is so proud of uh, the human rights and about everything that happened since the uh, French Revolution, but at at the at the Peripheric uh, parts of the of the union, you have conditions that are not what humans should face. They, they, these conditions are not uh, they're against uh, the human rights. So, um, so I think, um, but but the, the problem, of course, is uh, that uh, on the on the one hand, or if if you put it very, very simple, it seems that if you help too many of those refugees, get them to Germany, yeah. then the AFD will win, uh, gain power. I think that's, that is not true. It's about how you, um, how do you discuss this, how you frame it, um, how you really do the decisions and how you uh, communicate uh, those decisions. We, we, but we, it's a super complex, a problem because we also have, of course, like uh, countries like Hungary, uh, which is a member of the U European Union, who refuses to take refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's 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 just right into some of the problematic parts of uh, nowadays politics and of multilateral um, agreements that do not really work, that need compromises, but sometimes you get the feeling that the compromises are a bit, well, leaking. Leaking, uh, that's a good word to uh, So yeah, I think it's probably uh, need a whole uh, hour. hour of debate <laughs> to answer this question. <laughs> I'm going to take you back uh, to you. I mean, we've talked a lot about the current situation. Let me take you back to the world in your book, Ramshi's Fall, where, where you had these two stories growing, right? So one is about Ramshi himself. He's in a sanatorium in Russia. And then he comes back to Italy, which is Mussolini's Italy. He sort of defies Mussolini in parliament and then is shipped off to prison. And then the does his last days in prison and the famous prison notebooks. And then you have a, a Gramsci researcher who's in Germany, who's escaping his failed marriage by researching a possible lost notebook. Uh, you know, he's going to Rome and he's researching this possible lost notebook of Gramsci. Of course, the first thing I thought, wow, so many places sitting in the middle of a pandemic and reading a book that's set in Mosul in Russia and, and Germany and Italy and all them like, wow, I remember a world when we could go back and forth between all these places. But to me, uh, what struck me is that you looked at these people also through the lens of love. And, you know, because we're looking at this man, the, France, the Gramsci researcher Anton, who is fleeing his marriage, is attracted to this woman he suddenly sees on the street. And meanwhile, Gramsci has married this woman who is left behind in Russia while he's in prison and he's talking, you know, dealing with her sister. Why did you want to look at this story through the lens of love? Um, because I think, I mean, it was a decision I made 
while I was reading Gramsci's letters. And uh, what struck me was that he was not only um, a giant, uh, an intellectual giant and uh, like a very, very, very intelligent and extraordinary uh, thinker, but he was also uh, deeply sensible, but also deeply hurt emotional person and he had um he, he was he was writing about his uh childhood and his um impression that he is someone who could not be loved and i think that is quite interesting someone who uh takes his whole life to uh to fight for a more equal more fair society but also to, for the worth of, of every person in the society who, who himself has the impression that something like love, not only romantic love, but like family love, love from, from your parents, from your friends, but love is nothing that is uh, possible that, for him, that, 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 that he can be loved. Right, that he's yeah, unworthy yeah. of love while he's fighting exactly. for everybody's worth. And, and then, yeah, and then he he is so, so encouraged and so, so hard fighting for for the worth of other people i think that was a thing i thought is really really interesting and then to um to have on the one hand his strong fight uh on the political side and then his shyness his um vulnerable uh, he's vulnerable uh his um hurt feelings when it comes to this uh love relationship with Julia, his, uh, his, his wife, and, and how he uh, loses uh, the, the relation during, again, uh, because of a political situation, because he is put to prison. Um, and, but then also, uh, the, the second thing, that um, we can also see the relation that he has to, to his wife on a metaphorical um, level, like the relation has to the the party the communist party mm -hmm. uh, and the ideas or the hopes he combines with it it's it's the communist party before stalin that that's important to say for for all those uh who don't have that on, on the screen um and then uh lenin dies and stalin takes over and so that's that's the moment where this kind of love story uh, is disrupted, is, is ended. Um, so, so you have uh, like the, the connection and on the emotional and the political way. And, I, uh, and you, you mentioned Anton, Anton Stöber, the, the researcher nowadays who tries to escape the, his marriage uh, and to, to get some, some steps uh, forward in his career. And he's uh, mostly an opposite of Gramsci. He has lost the hope in, 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 in the utopian ideas in a world that could be better than the world we have. He is uh, quite uh, focused on his own uh, very selfish. comfortable life. He's super selfish. Um, he uses Gramsci not not as a not as a thinker who opens the perspective on the world for him, but only as a mirror to himself. And I think with with this uh, Anton Stöber, of course, he's he's like um, uh, he's more the funny part of the book, I would say. But also, I wanted to uh, characterize uh, a generation, and I think that is uh, somehow the generation. Um, that we had that led us to people like Donald Trump. Um, it's not that Antonio, uh, Anton Stöber would support somebody like Donald Trump, but he would be someone who's so focused on himself that he would not even see that there's coming such a difficult, dangerous situation in politics because he is not taking care of society and about uh, the future that could become our future. Yeah, so, because like Gramsci, Nora Gramsci says, you know, there's that famous uh, line where he says for the book where he says, for years I have not looked in a mirror. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Anton only looks in the mirror. <laughs> He's only about himself and what it will mean to him. I mean, this is a man for people who have not read the book where 
he's at his mistress's and his wife calls to say that her mother has possibly had a stroke. And he's mostly annoyed that she's sort of interrupting him right now. And it's like he doesn't, just doesn't want to deal with it, which, which we might find almost inhuman. But he's, he's only thinking about himself and his convenience. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, he's, he's uh, like treating other people like a narcissist would treat other people. So it's not um, what, what Gramsci does. He's, he has the deep um, in, in insecurity uh, if he can be loved or not, if love is something that he can touch uh, at least. Uh, and Anton Stu and, and that's or at least in the in the book, I, I, I write it a bit that way. That's uh, one one reason why he fights so much to touch people, to uh, to 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 work for a better world, to to get give everybody everyone uh, a place in this world, and uh, let to to let everybody be seen in this world. And uh, Anton Stöber is is like. Uh, he's not. He's he's so uh, secure, so so uh, sn snobbish about him Smug. being in love. Yeah, uh, that uh, that he's he's not he's not fighting for for anything. He's not um, taking. He's not taking care of other people, and that is what Gramsci does. And that is why I think that his tender love story shows. A lot about him, and uh, also a lot about his ideas. And it's it's not that you that you only have like the the, the uh, dry theory, but that you see a human, um, a tender human, caring for other people and and uh, suffering because he loses the connections to other people, to the society, to uh, the ones he loves, and uh, so. That, that is there's somehow uh, the illustration of what Gramsci's thoughts, at least in my opinion, are about. And um, at the end of the book, I think it's 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 I can I can say <laughs> as much. Uh, there there's some some I, some last question about someone uh, who never has been loved or who feels that he never has been loved. And how can this person um, love a whole uh, community or society? And that is a question that um, Gramsci really had in his, in his notebooks. And um, it's, it, I think it takes, it goes a step back. It, it, has, it brings back politics to, to, the, to the question of what are humans to each other? What do they mean to each other? How, are, uh, how is our life and society possible? And what is the, hum the real humanistic idea behind it? So, so I think it's, um, it's, it's not only like a romantic uh, story with a lot of roses and a lot of uh, perfume, but it's, it's something that shows uh, the, the inner life of, of Antonio Gramsci. In fact, the quote that you're talking about is where it says, can you love a mass of people when one has never loved a single person oneself, which is, yeah. um, you know, it's another way of the whole personal is the political uh, thing to be twisted around. But in that sense, when he, when somebody like a Gramsci says, my biggest weakness is not finding the metal to remain alone without any connections, attachments, relationships at all, that is the source of all the misery. Um, do you find that sad? Well, I find um, a lot of sad moments in, in, in Gramsci's, not only in his life, but also in the things that he forces himself to. Um, but also there's a lot of, there's, there's, there are also moments of joy, mom, moments of, of pleasure and happiness. And um, I mean, there's this this moment where he he gets close to to Julia the first time and he's so um, overwhelmed that quite well, he, he tries to push her away because he's he's afraid that uh, the feelings for her would um, would stop his fight for the revolution. But then he burns the letter uh, and he 
yeah, of course he he does, doesn't send it to her. Uh, so this that's and that's a moment that even this Anton Stöber, this uh, not so not so heroic <laughs> other protagonist of this uh, novel has that he remembers one moment when he was really in love with his ex-wife or his wife he goes uh, to to the to, to be divorced with and that and then he says that is that is a moment well because of that i knew everything and that was just it was just the moment that was so real and so deep and so huge that was worth everything uh, in, some, in some ways so even this person Get touched in in some some moment, and um, of course he's he's yeah he, he he's taking other results out of it, and uh, and Gramsci is he's divided between his strong uh, will and his strong um, also very disciplined uh, fight for for his utopian um, vision. And uh, he's taking himself so much back and his own uh, wishes and his own right. personal wishes. Um, but still this, this the, the being touched in this relationship, in this close relationship he has uh, with this woman and later with uh, his oldest son, the, the younger son he will never meet because of the uh, prison situation. Um, he uh, he gets to know new nuances of his character and he gets to learn some other strengths he didn't know about before. Then of course the, the prison situation brings him back in a solitary and a, in a divided, in a isolated situation where, of course, the loss is much harder than if he had never started a relationship, if he had always been in solitary as he was when he was a student. Right. So actually what he feared uh, came true. Uh, yeah, that I mean, but that is, that is always uh, the peril of the danger of love, right? That um, exactly. if you do it, then you may, I mean, love is meaningless without loss. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> which uh, we're so almost uh, about time, which well, when we bring about love and loss, it sort of brings us back to the pandemic because this has been very much a year where we've experienced both. I think many of us have understood uh, quite painfully uh, both of these things. So um, let me ask you, Nora, how are you keeping your optimism? What helps for you? Are you reading? What are you reading? Um, yeah, well, my optimism, if, if I, um, on, on the good days, um, I keep it with, uh, of course, with reading, um, with friends. I mean, I, of course, you don't see as many people as you normally see and you miss a lot of people. But um, I really see how, how important relationships are. Uh, let, let it be love relationships, let it be family relationships or friendships. And I think that is something we can be, if we have them, we can be so grateful. And um, you, I think that was one of the better part of this last year that I at least get closer to some people. Of course, I, I lost people. I, uh, I lost them for a moment or I lost them forever, as, as I said, about the funeral. But uh, I really got uh, touched by some people uh, that wouldn't have happened the same way in like our normal situation when we are just rushing from one day to the other, from one important thing to the next one. Uh, so I think that uh, with everything that was terrible about this uh, and about and difficult and um, yeah, that will still remain difficult afterwards. Is, uh, it was, that, that was is hopefully something, something yeah, we can hold we on can to now. Really Take from. be grateful for. Um, we're actually out of time and I am 
very grateful to you for spending this hour uh, talking to all of us about Thank Gramsci you. and much more. Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> uh, but so let me turn it over to Naveen Kishore. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, Sudeep. Thank it's you. Very, very engaging conversation. And, uh, it's interesting that, I mean, I'd, I'd like to read a line that you start your book with from Gramsci. And it is true that we will do certain mean things to those we love. And well, what can I say? Love and loss. Thank you so much. And um, for our listeners, I just wanted to say that we will be back next month with uh, one more conversation between Cindy and Katharina Winker, um, our author. And that you will get to, if you go to the Goethe site, you can listen to this wonderful actor, Cassie Layton, reading from Ground Trees. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Thank you, goodbye.